Our gospel reading comes from the book of Luke, starting at the first chapter and the 46th verse. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty has done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Here ends the reading. You see, the title in the sermon today is Infant Holy, Infant Lowly. I decided to go in a little different direction, but you'll still see the theme coming along uh, as we move through the sermon today. When I looked at the appointed scripture readings uh, for this morning, I was very puzzled. And I couldn't figure out why is it when we are a week before Palm Sunday, two weeks before Easter, right in the middle of Lent, and we are reading about the announcement of Jesus' conception and Mary's response uh, to that. And I thought, that, but then it finally hit me. March is nine months before December. And what is nine months before December 25th, but March 25th? March 25th in the church calendar is the commemoration of the angel Gabriel visiting the Virgin Mary. But the scripture readings of the, of the Annunciation this year come even a little earlier than the 25th, as uh, we have Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, and of course those are important to tell the story of Jesus as well. And so we have it right in the middle of this month. Now, in the Eastern churches, like in Russia, Greece, they don't worry about, you know, that there has to be space for Palm Sunday or space only for Easter and the resurrection. They'll just even read it, where it's the one reading will be Jesus' you know, uh, conception and then his resurrection in, this, in the same cycle of readings. Now, you might be wearied at the thought of, oh, we got to think about Christmas already, you know, when you see the stores have their merchandise out in October, and that really feels early. But there's a Lenten theme to be found, even in this too, and you'll hear it today. Now, first of all, remember that we remember that when Jesus was hanging on the cross in agony, Mary stood at the foot of the cross. And while she was not experiencing the physical torture that Jesus did by being whipped and scourged, we can only imagine the terrible emotions that she was feeling. How could any mother not be beside herself to see her baby that she had once carried for nine months and had rocked to sleep, was now experiencing the worst that humanity could ever inflict upon a person. And the emotions of Mary at the foot of the cross are expressed well in a Lenten hymn. And the words are, At the cross her station keeping stood the mournful mother weeping close to Jesus at the last. Through her heart her sorrow sharing all his bitter anguish bearing now at length the sword had passed. Mary had to endure much pain on numerous occasions, even before the stress uh, of her labor and delivery as well. We can think of even more examples of how Mary had to experience pain because of the sake of Jesus. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that when Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant, that he did not want to embarrass his family, and so he wanted to break off the engagement. And you can imagine how many people were skeptical of Mary's claim that this uh, pregnancy was something supernatural. 
not counting the discomfort that Mary would have experienced in giving birth to Jesus in a stable. When the baby Jesus was brought to the temple for his dedication, the old man Simeon prophesied that Jesus' death would pierce Mary's soul. And we just heard those words in that quoting that Lenten hymn. A sword shall pierce your own soul too. Now the account of Simeon's prophecy to Mary is found in Luke chapter 2 immediately following his birth. And because she was Jesus' biological mother and played a most central role in his conception, it's interesting, is it not, that Mary really isn't mentioned in that many places. She's here and there, but it's not a great part of uh, the story and of the Gospels. Only three of the four Gospels even tell us that her name was Mary. The Gospel of John simply says, Jesus' mother. And of these three Gospels that actually do give us her name, Mary is, uh, oh, excuse me, Mark doesn't mention anything about Jesus' birth. Chapter 1 of uh, Mark begins with John the Baptist. So while three of the Gospels actually reveal Mary's actual name, there are many other names that the that people have come up with for her. And both Matthew and Luke describe Mary as being a virgin, and so she's often referred to as the Virgin Mary or the Virgin Mother. And when Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, uh, when John... When Elizabeth met Mary, you know, when John leapt in the womb, uh, what did Elizabeth say? But why is it that the mother of my Lord would fulfill his promises? And so sometimes Mary has been called the Blessed Mother. And there are other names that have evolved uh, for Jesus' mom, uh, especially like in artwork. You've probably heard a reference to uh, Mary as being the Madonna course, quite different than the 1980s <laughs> um, uh, singer, although I guess she did sing like a virgin and just like a prayer. But we've heard Mary referred to uh, in French, Notre Dame, Our Lady. And one of the more unusual names in the history of the church for Jesus' mother is calling her the Theotokos. Theo, like as in God, Tokos, bear, that's Greek. There was a man from the 400s named Nestorius. And Nestorius was the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople. That's kind of like being the pope in the Eastern Church, in Turkey. It was the second most uh, important office in the church after the pope himself. And it had become commonplace in the church by the year 400 that to call Mary the Theotokos, the God-bearer, because Mary had given birth to Christ, who the church had confesses is God. But Nestorius was uncomfortable with this. He didn't like the term God-bearer. He believed that somehow it made Mary like, kind of like part of the Trinity or something like that. And so he would call uh, Mary the Christotokos, the Christ-bearer. But Theotokos, the God-bearer, no. But Nestorius lost the battle, even though he was the number two man in all the church. And at the Fourth Ecumenical Council in the city of Ephesus in the year 451, the argument prevailed that because Christ is God, then on earth it is appropriate for Mary to be called the mother of God, the God-bearer, as long as it's understood that, you know, that she's the bearer of Christ when he came to earth and not that she existed or something you know, before her birth. Now you and I, of course, we don't use that term for Jesus' mother very often. But it's important that we affirm that Christ really is God, but also that he is true man, as we confess in our, in our creeds. If Christ really came to stand in our place as a substitute and to be a human being, then it was necessary for him to have a human mother. As the book of Galatians chapter 4 says that Christ was born of a woman, born under the law. Now, unlike the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, in Protestantism, we do not pay as much attention to Mary. 
Not like other churches, like in the Catholic Church, where they even the, you know, recite the rosary where Mary is referenced all the time. Martin Luther and the other reformers, they moved away from that kind of devotion to Mary because things had crept up that they couldn't find any basis in Scripture for. Things like that Mary was born without the taint of original sin. Well, if she had to bear Jesus who had no sin, well, then she must have not had original sin. Not thinking that, well, then you would have to just keep going backwards and backwards. Or that uh, another claim was that Mary had always been a virgin and that Jesus had no biological half-brothers or sisters. And the Reformers couldn't find any indication in the scriptures that that was the case as well. But just because Luther and the other Reformers moved away from the doctrines about Mary, it did not mean and does not mean that they did not have respect for our Lord's mother. Luther wrote an entire commentary on Mary's song of praise, which we heard this morning. It's called the Magnificat, and those words come from Latin, where Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Martin Luther appreciated the structure of the Magnificat. See, Martin Luther was an Old Testament professor, and so he could read Hebrew. And just like the Psalms, Mary's song followed that Hebrew style of poetry where everything kind of has like a balance. You say something, and then you say something with different words, but with a similar meaning. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. That parallel. My soul matches my spirit. Magnifies the Lord matches rejoices in God my Savior. And I think we would all agree that the Magnificat, Mary's song, is one of the most beautiful pieces of the scripture. But its beauty is beyond any type of literary uh, appreciation of any poetic structure. Luther noted how the theology of the cross is seen in Mary's words. Now, you maybe have never heard of the term put together, the theology of the cross, but it describes how Christ's glory is truly revealed in how God the Father sent his son Jesus Christ to do his work. Now Christ's glory was most uh, revealed not in Palm Sunday, not when the crowds are waving their palm branches and singing Hosanna, but it was when Jesus was fully seen as the one who gave everything on the cross, who suffered and died for a death that he didn't deserve at all. He won the victory, not by military conquest, but by being humiliated, dying in the capital punishment of his day. We see an earlier example of the theology of the cross in Mary's song, too. Instead of God choosing uh, a, a really important woman, a queen, or a woman of great wealth, for Jesus to have as his mother. God the Father chose a teenage woman of no particular uh, background other than that she was descended of David. Because of just being such an ordinary, common person, you know, Mary was rightly taken back, you know, by her, her being the choice. You know, we hear her words about how she communicates and how she expresses, you know, the bewilderment about, you know, he's, God has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down the rulers from their thrones, but he's lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things. He sent the rich away empty. We hear that sense of like the tables turning, roles reversing. There are revolutionary elements, are there not, to Mary's words there. And people have recognized that. Political leaders have even feared the words of Mary because it sounds too much like political upheaval. It was illegal at certain times in British uh, colonized India and even in some places in Latin America. Outside of the church service, it was not legal to speak the words of Mary's Magnificat, because it, would, it was feared it would incite revolution, bringing the wealthy down from their throne, sending the rich away empty. It is true that in Christ's kingdom, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. 
But to only view the Magnificat as some type of political ideology is to not see something much bigger. Through Jesus, the poor are filled with good things. Because the ultimate hope of this world is not in finding your next meal, as important as that will be for your day. But we remember the scripture's words, Psalm 146, put not your trust in princes. The most revolutionary part of Mary's words is that God's kingdom is ultimately not accomplished through any human government. It's not found in political theory. God's work is not found ultimately in who is our president. The Almighty God accomplishes beautiful and big things through ordinary people in everyday circumstances. While he's the Lord of the universe, he brings many and great small blessings. He wins people through everyday conversation. And God continues to do his ordinary and common work through people like me and you just like he did through ordinary people like Elizabeth and Mary. We think well of Mary for her response and her obedience and how she reacted to the news of her pregnancy. And so when the Lord calls you to a certain situation, when he places something on your heart, when he calls you to share a witness, answer the same way that Mary did. Because you're, some, you're somebody who's common and ordinary just like Mary was. When the Lord calls you to something in life, when he's placing a burden on your heart, may your answer be like the mother of our Lord. Let it be, Lord, according to your will. Let's pray about that today. Heavenly Father, we thank you in sending your son Jesus Christ to come to this world to live a life of teaching and, and preaching, proclamation. And we thank you, Lord, that you sent him through the Virgin Mary, that he was born of a woman, born under the law, that he could be our, our human substitute for our sins and to intercede from us to you. And so, Heavenly Father, as we think about Jesus' mother and Thankfulness for what she did in raising her son and being there and supporting him even as she saw him suffer and how she suffered too. We think of her words this morning uh, as we uh, remember uh, today thinking of how in this part of uh, the year we think ahead nine months to, to Jesus being, being born. And we thank you, Lord, for how Mary responded with such humility, with a sense of service. How she realized that it wasn't anything in her or, you know, that she had somehow earned some privilege, but just that you had found favor with her and that she responded, let it be, Lord, according to your will. And so, Heavenly Father, we think of that vocation that you lay upon our lives, too, as we go about our work, as we go to our, our jobs and take care of our children and grandchildren and look after our neighbors, that we would do small things too, Lord, that you call us to, because that's just how you work. That while you are the mighty God of the universe, the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord of heaven and earth, that you do your work not only through the big and grand, but also through the small and seemingly insignificant, but important it really is. So empower our service each day that we would be willing servants to do your work and to repent when we have failed to take those opportunities through inaction or saying the wrong thing. We thank you, Lord, that you forgive us and that we are forgiven because of your son, Jesus Christ, dying so cruelly on the cross and for his mother supporting him there. And it's in your Son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. What could be and what couldn't be, just like either Simon or Judas were thinking. But Lord, that we would just simply be grateful to be in your presence and to be thankful for how you redeemed each one of us from the pit of our transgressions.
how you've rescued us. And how you've rescued us in such an inglorious way. A dying death of capital punishment. So that we could live in glory with you in heaven forever. Lord, Lord, as we prepare for this holy week, as we think on your great sacrifice, that we would have gratefulness in our hearts and contrition for our sins, thankfulness that your son Jesus Christ suffered so that we could be forgiven and be in right relationship with you, to be saved and have the hope of eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for this season so that we can focus on these great truths that you have for us in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.